Thanks, Doctor. Up next, we have uh, Liesl. Liesl, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, we're looking forward to your question as well. Hi, Dr. Vinod. It is such an honor. And um, I say you've got such a calming, peaceful voice. It's, it's just so amazing to listen to. Oh, well, thank uh, you. That's kind of you. Yeah. So my question is um, on thyroid. I've had high antibodies for a very long time. I've been vegan for almost two years. Um, but I've still got high antibodies. The rest is fine. Um, and then the, uh, the next thing would be, uh, I had my Mirena removed about three or four weeks ago. So hormone balancing wise, how long would it take? I'm sorry, let, let me, uh, there was a little bit of a breakup on your, on, as you're asking your question, asking your question, you said that you have thyroid antibodies that have persisted. And you said one other thing, which I didn't hear. I had the Mirena and I had it removed. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, quite reasonable to have that removed. Um, regarding the antibodies, um, thyroid antibodies, we, we're unfortunately still at the beginning of this science. And the findings that I mentioned earlier from the Adventist health studies suggested that people who avoid animal products are the least likely to have these autoimmune antibody related thyroid problems. And a number of people like the case that I described have shown that when they get away from animal products, they do a lot better. Um, you've done that, but you've still got some antibodies. Um, the question that is going to arise is could this autoimmune condition, hypothyroidism, um, I, I, by the way, are you hypo or hyper? You're, you're low thyroid, right? I'm, I'm neither. The, my T3 oh. is fine, my T4 is fine. Everything is fine. Everything's in the norm. It's just the antibodies that, that are high and they're still high. And I'm, maybe, I, I don't know where it get better over time. Oh, it's I see. Okay. So oh. Long. okay, all right. Okay, well, that puts a different complexion on things. Um, were you ever hypothyroid? No, never. Then why was your doctor checking your antibodies? I just, when I, when I check my thyroid, I check everything. I just have them <laughs> check all four. So you never, you never had a thyroid problem. You just have this, this quirky lab value. Y yeah. <laughs> Wild. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let me speculate with, first of all, I'm glad it sounds like you're well, great. You're taking good care of yourself and you're being extra cautious. Good on you. That's fantastic. Um, and I'm going to speculate with you for, for just a minute. Um, you can talk with your doctor to see if there's some other explanation, but here's what we think is probably happening is that for some people past dietary exposures will cause continuing presence of some antibodies that just continue. That's one possibility. Even if the food is gone, um, it's sort of like if you had a uh, measles when you were a kid, you can still make antibodies to it now. Um, the other possibility is that certain other foods, as food exposures, that for most people are okay, might be causing antibodies in you. What I mean is, let's say you're allergic to strawberries. There's nothing wrong with strawberries, but if you're allergic, they're going to cause a reaction for you that might be very mild. So the question is, could some other food be doing that? Now, no doctor, I wouldn't think, is going to suggest any kind of treatment if your thyroid is, is, is in the healthy range, just based on the presence of the antibodies. You can certainly talk to your doctor about it, to see if there's anything you need to be concerned about. But from what you've told me so far, it sounds like you're doing great. So thank you for that uh, very sophisticated question. Doctor, thank you. And sure. up next, we have Julie. Julie, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Doctor, thank you so much for your enthusiasm. Sure, well, thank you. Thanks for being part of the program. This is grand. Um, I was associated with the Adventist people for a while to learn um, vegetarianism. And, but my question is about cooked. I have two questions. One is the cooked versus raw percentage. Because many people like more cooked than raw. And I think that you may have an answer to that. What would be a proper percentage? Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you, what have you found? Have you been having more raw foods in your diet? And if so, well, I just usually do 50%. Uh huh. And, and which foods are they? The raw foods that you're bringing in? Just whatever's available. I do local. So okay. whatever, you know, whether it's, it's fruits or vegetables or avocados, I'm in Southern Florida. So we get a lot of avocados and, and oranges and grapefruits and citrus fruits and um, not as many nuts. But okay. uh, a lot of lettuce, a lot of greens. I, yeah. I grow moringa. I have a lot of um, edible or edible greens that I get from Echo Global Farm, which is they're like Kaituk and, and yeah. Chaya and, 
few other things like that that I use. Okay, well, you're doing great. The question you've asked is one that we don't know exactly the answer to, um, but a few general principles might apply. Number one, um, as a species, we didn't evolve with sterno. So in other words, we weren't cooking all the time. We evolved with raw foods. Um, cooking came much, much later. Now cooking did some good things. Um, it gave us beans and it gave us grains, which if you don't cook them, you're not gonna really eat them. Um, unless you say sprout beans or something like that. It made a lot of vegetables accessible to us and it allowed us to greatly expand the range of foods we could eat that allowed human beings to expand the territory that they could occupy. So suddenly they could start migrating all, to all kinds of places. And that then put them in touch with foods that people had never eaten before. And once people wandered over the Bering Strait into North America, and then they started coming down through Canada, United States, and then down into South America, they started having foods that they'd never had before, like tomatoes and peanuts and chocolate and all kinds of potatoes, all these things that you didn't have in Africa where our sojourn began. So that raises the question, let's say I wanna eat more raw foods. Which foods are they? I am gonna guess that tomatoes and things like peanuts might not be the ones that are most natural for people. It doesn't mean they're unhealthy, but they're just not part of humans early existence. And what are the foods that would be most natural for us? I'm gonna speculate that it would be the foods that were growing in Eastern Africa when human beings uh, sort of began their, their time on earth, so to speak. Um, so we don't really know exactly what they are, um, but what, what you're gonna discover is A, the more raw foods you eat, the, the, the more power you have against excess weight. Generally speaking, a raw diet is a really good thing. And if you're kind of 50-50 it, that means you're not gonna go hungry. You'll be able to take advantage of more cooked food when you want it. But with regard to which foods are the best foods to include in a raw diet, there we don't exactly know. Human beings had to find their way to China before they were having oranges probably. Um, so uh, we, we, we do speculate that certain foods um, are probably better than others, but my guess is the only way to really tell is to see which ones agree with you the most. Um, and by agree with you, I mean digestively and also mentally. If you feel okay with them and your digestion is good with them, those, that's a sign that chances are you're gonna probably be um, all right with them in other ways too. So that's not a very complete answer to, to your question, but uh, that's a great question. 